it's already a good start. Uh, usually I give this lecture in about uh, 35 minutes, so in 25 minutes will be pretty tough. Um, I will not talk about, of course, mathematics, but much more the philosophy behind statistics, which is much more important. You do, in a certain sense, not need the mathematics to understand, of course, statistics. So when I was a medical student, I always looked first, like everybody, to the p-value. What is much more important beside the p-value, and we'll see how the p-value is calculated, it's much more the, the surrounding around the p-value that is important. And so we'll go to type 1 errors, type 2, the absolute uh, risk, the type of test very shortly, but this is, of course, um, very important. So the p-value, uh, what is important to know about statistics is that uh, one does not prove something with statistics. The result is not certain, but probable. One does not calculate whether two or more groups are different, but to which extent this group may still be similar by chance. So we do not prove differences. You calculate the probability that two groups are similar by chance. Um, and once the level of the probability is behind the 5%, then we say they are different. But in fact, we didn't prove that they were different. We simply say that the probability that they are different is very small. Okay? So we will always have the probability of taking a wrong conclusion. This will be the type 1 and then the type 2 errors. So, um, and then I will show you how this is calculated. But when you hear about null hypothesis, well, it's about... Um, the two averages that, uh, from the two groups that are similar, and if you subtract them, they should be B0. At that moment, when the p-value is less than 5%, you will accept the alternative hypothesis that this is no longer zero, and that the two differences are different. So how this is calculated, this does not matter. If you use a t-test, the p um, a he -quares test, the fischer exec test, um, this, 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 is not, this is not the problem. Um, it's always the same. It's about comparing averages of proportions um, while taking into account the spreading of the variability of variance around the average. Okay? So everybody knows, of course, the normal distribution. If you look to the normal distribution and you uh, take the p-level at 5%, what you do, or what statisticians do, you have here the complete surface and you can uh, put an integral on this, and then you will have a 100% of the surface. The 5% is taken on both sides. You take 2.5% here of this surface, 2.5% of that surface, and of course, in the middle, you are at 95% of the surface. So once you start to compare two groups, here, arithmetically, they seem different, but at a statistical level, if you take the spreading into account, they are not different because this value here does not enter into the critical surface. Okay. So here again, they are not different at statistical level, they are different at arithmetic level, but here still the alternative hypothesis does not hold. Once it's entering in that surface, at that moment you will consider both groups as different. Okay. So most of the time we use the p-value at 0 0.5 and two-sided, because um, in human research, it's important that you take into account that it can go on both sides. Your drug can increase the mortality or decrease the mortality. However, if you are doing animal studies, you can use on one side p-value. Why? Because, of course, this will enter here, this surface, much sooner, and you will have to sacrifice less animals, and so it will cost less. Suppose you have a drug, you know that it decreases the tension, Okay, if you know that from other experiences, then in animal studies sometimes on one side it is used because again, you know in which direction that it goes. So of course the implication is that it is a probability and not a certainty, and there is still a probability of taking a wrong conclusion. So let's go to the type 1 errors. What is the type 1 error? There's the probability to reject a null hypothesis when in fact it's true, I would say in better words, probability that a new drug is effective when in fact this is not. This is error of excessive credulity. This is the 5% level. You still have 5% probability to take a wrong conclusion. So if you would do the experience again 20 times, you will have the same results once, simply by chance. Without any effectiveness of your drug or efficacy of your drug. 
okay? This is the 5% level. You still have a 5% chance that what you see is not true. The problem here is that the more tests performed, the higher the probability of taking a wrong conclusion. So suppose that uh, the probability, not suppose, the probability that the alternative hypothesis is true is 95%. Uh, suppose that you take five tests, then you have to multiply these tests. The overall p-value of alternative hypothesis will be 0 0.77. The p-value, the real p-value for all these tests is 0 0.23 and no longer 0 0.05. So this is important, you have an inflation. The more tests you perform, the more probability that you will find something. So suppose here you have an observational trial, you compare a study group versus placebo, you start at ICU mortality, you say, ah, it's a pity, it's a 0 0.08, will be difficult to publish. Then you continue in hospital mortality, 0 0.07, you continue 60 days, 0 0.09, and then you continue to search into your database. The length of stay is not different, and then suddenly, ah, Ventilator-associated pneumonia is less 0.03. You say, yes, I find something. Well, the real p-value is not 0.03, but you performed five tests, it will be about 0.23. Okay? So that's the reason, of course, and that is a little bit the problem in observational trials. You can reduce the number of tests by formulating, of course, the research hypothesis first. So you increase your pre-test probability that what you see is true, and not afterwards. And this will become more and more evident when you will, will go through the slides. And you can adjust the significant level to a lower level. You have many, uh, you have Boniferori um, um, adjustments and so on. Or you can, for instance, say I will only use um, the differences that have a p-value zero at 0 0.01 level, for instance. The interventional trials, well, that's the reason why the primary and secondary endpoints are fixed and reported to the authorities before the start of the trial. Because then you can only perform one or two p-values. You have the pretest probability, and that's why you have to report them. That you do not change your primary endpoint afterwards, and you are searching and searching until you find a difference. Let's go to the type two errors. This is what we call the beta significance level. It's the probability to accept the null hypothesis when in fact it's not true. So in uh, better wordings, probability that new drug is ineffective when in fact it is. It's an error of excessive skepticism. This is most often put at uh, the 20% level, so 20% probability to draw a wrong conclusion, or 80% probability to draw a correct conclusion. So this is what we call the power analysis. The power analysis says you calculate how many patients should be at least included in a trial in order to end up with a significant result. And for the pharmaceutical industry, it's in fact that point, is how many patients cost should be included in our trial in order to dictate to the high probability, 80%, most often it's put at 80%, a significant and relevant effect of a new drug. So if the pharmaceutical industry can make their point with two times 200 patients, why should they include two times 30,000 patients? It will cost too much, so they will calculate how many patients they need to find the difference at the 80% level. Then we go to the uh, absolute risk and relative risks. Um, I would say don't focus on the p-value only. This is very important. The size and precision of the effect have to be taken into account. For example, suppose that you have a very, very highly significant but very small difference in mortality. What is the clinical relevance? You put two times 30,000 patients in a trial with vitamin C and you see that, for instance, the blood pressure is decreasing by one millimeter uh, mercury. It has no clinical relevance at all, okay? But huge differences in mortality between a new drug and a placebo, in absence of statistical significance, may uh, say maybe that you have a lack of power, that you didn't include enough patients to see a difference. So you have to look, of course, not only to the p-value, but also to the size and the precision. And the size and the precision is the 95 confidence interval. This means that if you would repeat 100 times the same trial, this, is, this difference would lays in the 95% confident um, interval. The broader the interval, the less precise the estimates effect. The, the persons uh, received the slides afterwards, Manu? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So the absolute difference in effects, um, averages, absolute risks, and so on, you should look whether zero is not included in the interval. 
then if zero is not included, you are pretty sure that it will be, not pretty sure, it will be the p-value less than 0, 0, 0.05. For relative difference, one should not be included. I will show you that in the next slide. This is the well-known progress trial. Here you have the relative risks, here you have the absolute risks. Here, the absolute risk, the difference between the placebo and the drotecoring alpha is 6%. Look to the confidence interval, 1.9 to 10.4. It's an absolute risk, zero is not in the interval, so I know that this will be statistically significant. And I can see here also because they provide a p-value. But even without p-value, I would know that it is significant. The relative risks here, one is not included in that interval. So here you have a 30% mortality, 31. Here you have 24. Six is about 20% of 30. That's why the relative risk decrease with 20% from one to 0 0.8. Okay, so this is the relative risks. If you want to calculate the number needed to treat, you have to divide one divided by 0 0.06, so 6% here, of 100 divided by six, and you will have about 17 patients that you need to treat to see, to have an effect. Most often the confidence intervals uh, look like this on the figure. So here you can see that this is significant, it is significant as long, this is here a relative risk, while taking time into account, you see here indeed that this one will not be uh, significant because one is in the interval. Although sometimes there are always little, little mistakes in the New England. Here, if you look to previous chemotherapy here, it is not significant, while here it is significant. So this interval is wrong, or that interval is wrong. Okay? Little mistake. Now, the type of tests. Uh, I show you the normal distribution. It is important to, have, to still have that normal distribution to use a, a classical t-test, because if you have not a normal distribution, you see here that the surface of the 5% will be different. It will bore be here, and here you will have no, nearly nothing, so your t-test will not be a good one to do that. You have also other distributions, what we call the kurtosis is different. So that is the reason why you have different t-tests, or different tests uh, to compare differences. Now, I will not enter too much in detail in which kind of test you should use, because simply on this PSS of an entry yet you can find very easily which test you should use in which circumstances. But usually, if it is two independent samples and you have continuous variables, normally distributions, you should use an independent t-test, not normally distributions, a Mandwini u-test, and in categorical variables, a classical v-square, or a Fisher exact if you have a two-time two uh, table. Here, if you have a three times two table, for instance, I compare mortality with sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock, you have three categories, you will not be able to calculate a Fischerec test uh, except between two categories. Now, we enter into the study design, which is um, the, the most important part, I think. And, of course, the king of the queen of the trials is the randomized compared trials. It is controlled in the sense that patients are allocated at random to receive either study drug or placebo. The trial is controlled in the sense that neither the patient nor the investigators decide who will receive the study drug. The aims to prove a causal relationship between the drug and the endpoints, but also to assess an accurate estimation of the effect of the drug. How? Well, very easy, at least conceptually. Focus on a study population in which it is highly likely that you will be able to prove the effectiveness of the new drug. Take care that both the drug and the placebo arm are similar at baseline. And keep them similar during the study period with exception of the study drug. So how does the pharmaceutical industry do that? They maximize the chance of a significant positive result because they first have animal studies or observational trials showing that a new drug or therapy has a good chance of being effective. They do a phase one and phase two studies they are looking to potentially serious side effects and also, of course, to the pharmacokinetics. They use strict inclusion and exclusion criteria in order to obtain a, as homogeneous study population as possible. They reduce the probability of a false positive result using predeterminant primary and secondary endpoints. So they will only calculate one or two or three or five uh, p-values and they will reduce the probability of a false negative result by doing first a power analysis. 
and then they will randomize. So we all know that uh, how randomization uh, occurs. Uh, random communication implies that each individual being entered into the trial has the same chance of receiving each of the possible interventions. Randomization is a very important one, this point. Randomization usually ensures an even distribution of confounders between groups. Provided that enough patients are included, both arms will be similar and known, but also unknown or unmeasured variables. And it is very important. You will eliminate confounding and selection bias, and differences in both arms can subsequently only be attributed to the new therapy or drug. So visually, it looks like this. You start at baseline with a similar patient population. You start your intervention over time, and progressively, you will have more and more patients, if your drug is, of course, working, where, indeed, the mortality will decrease, I hope so, with, for instance, here, 30%. Okay? Suppose, however, that your randomized control trials is poorly randomized, then you will have some differences at baselines. Okay? So we will overestimate potentially your effects or underestimate if, of course, it goes in the other direction. But here, for the, to, to keep it simple, we overestimate the effect. And you would say, oh, very easy. I will adjust for my differences. I will use logistic regression. OK, I agree with you that you can use your logistic regression, but on, no, only for the known variables, only for the amount of variables that you measured. So indeed, you will adjust but you still do not know here whether there are still other variables that are having a, a, an effect or biased your results. So this is very, so I would say don't believe, and I skipped some slides because we didn't have time today. I could show you that with studies, but don't believe in studies with two times 20 patients in the ICU. The most large trials need at least two times 800, two times 2,000 patients sometimes to make a difference. So a randomized controlled trials with two times 80 or two times 150 patients certainly for mortality, um, with one or two baseline differences, means that simply the randomized controlled trial is not randomized. Unfortunately, even if the authors or the investigators did their best, you have a baseline difference, and you are, this is in, in a certain sense an indication that you still can have other differences that were unmeasured in your trial. So you should do it again. So, imbalance is a known and measured baseline characteristic as a marker of poorly randomized control trials, since it indicates that other imbalances in unknown or unmeasured factors may occur. Imbalances are more likely to occur in small randomized trials performed in heterogeneous patient populations. So, a poorly randomized control trial is no longer really a randomized control trial. We still keep on saying that it's randomized, but it is poorly randomized. Then the randomization, to be effective randomization, should occur after inclusion, of course, because otherwise you could induce a selection bias, have systemic allocations, simple randomization, and so on, which is uh, a classical one, is a stratified randomization, where you stratify it in subgroups, well known about the literature, where you want to be pretty sure to do a subgroup analysis and to say, well, in that subgroup, it's important. There we know from previous studies that we should absolutely keep these two groups similar within the trial. How will you group the group similar afterwards? Well, via an intention to treat analysis. The analysis is based on initial treatment intent, not on the treatment eventually administered. So it is intended to avoid effects of dropouts, which may break the randomization to the treatment groups. So it is potential effect of the treatment policy is measured rather than the potential effect of a specific treatment. It is a conservative estimation of the treatment effects. It's real life. Modified intensive to treat analysis, or patients that for whatever reasons could not receive the third degree of placebo are excluded in the final analysis. Or now you have the per protocol analysis, only patients who completed the entire protocol, for example, seven days of antibiotics, are included in the final analysis. This is really the potential effect of a specific treatment here. However, more accurate estimation of the treatment effects. However, it's an ideal imaginary world because not all patients will be able to receive the treatment for seven days. This here a trial in the New England, clearly showing indeed what is happening. 
So here you see the absolute difference here is 10.7%. Here again, zero is not in the interval. You know very well that this is highly statistically significant. So the difference here in a modified intention to treat is 10%. So this is a rather conservative estimation of the treatment. Here it's a much more optimistic. This is a per protocol. Here it's a difference in 15%. What do you see? Here two times four, 450 patients more than 120 patients in both arms couldn't receive entirely their treatment. Okay? So the real effect in a certain sense is in between the 15 and the 10 percent. Then blinding, of course, I think you all know uh, uh, what blinding is and of course take care of monocenter unblinded studies because you will have a center effect at that moment. Um, so the blinded studies, of course, this is the ideal unblinded intervention, but if you unblind, of course, here, potentially, you can really believe in your results and will do harder your best in the group who is allocated to the study group. What is now the pitfall of a randomized controlled trial? Because always we say, well, it's the randomized controlled trial, we have to randomize everything. But the problem is that um, we see many phenomena in the daily practice that cannot be solved by the randomized controlled trials, so this is a huge problem. And then we simply say that the problem does not exist, that's not true, we do not have a methodology to, to show that maybe there is a difference. So the pitfalls is that the random sample must uh, represent the patient population, of course, that will subsequently be targeted. But don't forget that the pharmaceutical industry, in order to increase the chances of a positive result, the industry often uses strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. However, afterwards, of course, they will ask to have a more liberal prescription when the drug is on the market. And this is a very well uh, problem that was described here in the JAMA a couple of years ago. Uh, most, most, most of, for instance, patients with chronic dialysis are excluded from the trials. Who have the worst coronary heart disease? Patients who have chronic dialysis. So here we extrapolate study results from a rather normal population to a population who is on chronic dialysis. There you do not know whether your benefits of the harm is still in a good balance. It's similar with pediatrics. Many children receive drugs that were designed in a certain sense in adults. So this is a problem. And of course the industry will not do these trials because they take a risk of course to show that it is potentially harmful. So if uh, I had to, 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 if they ask me how they should do that, I would say don't do that. Keep it like this, everybody is using the drug, so why should you bother? So we have to take care that we do not simplify reality to such an extent that we become experts in nothing. I like this very much, this is a French philosopher, um, where you look to the trial and randomized controlled trial and you use the drug, but still in daily practice, you have to, of course, assess whether this is really a good thing to do. Now also, a second pitfall is that the measured effect is a relative one. Uh, we all know uh, the problem with the trials on the tidal ventilation. Um, did we overventilate the patient group, the control arm? Of, did we, of, is there a real effect? It's always the discussion. It's the discussion always in the randomized control trials. So just look very well to the placebo arm or to the standard arm, how they were treated. There you will see whether it is a relative effect of an absolute effect. And that was a very nice uh, editorial also um, in The Lancet a couple of years ago, is that, of course, when you enter into the daily practice, don't forget that you are still treating patients, and you have patients that are outliers and not in the average. So most of the time now, patients are forced into a treatment, while, of course, you should adapt the treatment to the patient. So keep in mind that, again, it's an average effect that you see, and that potentially you may overtreat an outlier. So how does the drug work then, and does the drug work as you expected? So again, the pharmaceutical industry, and I think I need five minutes, uh, Manu. So the, animal, uh, the pharmaceutical industry had animal studies. How does the drug work? They know very well, according to animal studies, that the drug is working on that protein and that protein. They have uh, very nice results about that. So they start, they know that they have a good chance that the drug will work. Then you go to phase one, is the drug safe, phase two. So this is what I would call the pretest probability. Then you have here phase three. Does it have an impact on mortality? This is the second probability. And then the third one is, did the drug work as you expected? Okay. Suppose that you accept that you give a beta blocker 
um, that it reduce mortality because it decrease the tension. And you end up with a difference in mortality, but nothing happened to the tension. Then you have a problem because you do not know how your drug is working, and the probability that there you simply have a difference by chance is much huger. Okay? So you re should really take these three uh, points into account. And then, if these three probabilities are high, it will be a very high probability, indeed, that it makes sense to use the drugs. Let's look to the PROVES trial. They had a very, very, very nice already studies, experimental studies, showing that the drug would work. So here it's very high. Then you already saw the slides. The difference was 6% with a p-value of 0.05. So we had only 5% chance that uh, the difference occurred by chance. So it was very low. So this is very high. And then, which is very important, they really looked whether the drug worked like they expected to work. They looked at the dedimers here in patients receiving the drug. So if you remember, they received the drug for four days. What do you see in patients who receive the drug? There is lower plasma dedimers, so lower microangiopathy, less DAC, and indeed, when you stop the drug, look, it's still increasing. Right? The placebo, indeed, has no effect at all. So did the drug work as expected? Yes. So the probability, indeed, that the, work, that the drug is working was pretty, pretty high. And you know what is happening subsequently. I still believe in the drug. I do not have any conflict of interest. Let's look then how we are often looking to observational trials. This is, for instance, a trial in the Blue Journal a couple of years ago, 2004, who was assessing combination antibiotic treatments. And they say that it lowers the mortality among severely ill patients with pneumococcal bacteremia. So the first thing, I'm not a statistician, but here you look already, you have two times 47 patients. They do not uh, give real p-values, uh, neither real numbers, so I cannot check via his square test or fisher exec test whether there is really a difference. So this, most of the time for me, this means that they have missing data. Um, and here they find two differences here. They find a difference in the two groups between uh, IHRV, and they find also a difference in mechanical ventilation, okay? So here we are in an observational trial. You do not have the pretest probability, at least at that moment, certainly not, in 2004. And you start here with only the trial, simply an observational trial, which have, of course, not this kind of design, but this kind of design. You may have a selection bias, you may have differences in baseline characteristics, you will give your intervention, but if it is a prospective trial, you are even able to influence your intervention. Okay, so we will have a huge, huge, huge problem here. So, of course, you can adjust for propensity scores, you can adjust for baseline characteristics, and so on, but still, again, you will not know whether there are unmeasured variables. Here, they had a difference in mortality of 32%. You even do not longer need nurses or physicians in the ICU to have such an effect. This is tremendous. And then, I can ask myself, why 40 days mortality? Most of the time, we use 28 days. I think I have an idea because once they adjust, it becomes less and less and less significant. Um, so here we have these two differences. And then they say, okay, we will adjust. What do you think of these results? If you have five minutes for an interactive. Nobody? Manu offers uh, a weekend to Barcelona, if you can answer to the questions. <laughs> or to, to Rome, sorry, or Milan, Milan. <laughs> Nobody? But you already saw that slide, uh, Manu. <laughs> Nobody? Well, here you see that the combination here, after adjustment for HIV status, is associated with the higher odds ratio. I will tell this uh, in my next presentation, is uh, usually, of course, you should, when they have a protective effect, you should uh, show an odds ratio which is lower than one. So here, simply, they inversed mortality versus survival. 
the Cochrane say, well, don't do that because it is difficult. You have to be an expert to know what is happening. Here you expect, indeed, in the same direction, here you expect, of course, a decrease in mortality. Here they show an increase in survival, which is not such a huge problem. But And here you see that HIV so increased mortality. Okay? What do you find of the second uh, model? What would you expect from mechanical ventilation? That it is increased the survival? No. Here again, they changed the 0 and the 1 at a variable level. So they missed, they say, instead of mechanical ventilation absence or presence, they changed the 0 and 1, so they changed two times. Yeah. So, so here, here it's pretty sure I never have seen a trial where mechanical ventilation is associated with a better survival. Never. So this is a small mistake, but the largest mistake is, nobody? I do not see a model adjusted for the two differences. They only have two differences. They adjust for one and then for the other. But where is the model for the two differences? And here you see already that the combination is borderline significant, not longer 0.01. Here it's 0 0.04. I can tell you if you take the two differences together, it will be no longer significant. And the reason is simply because I know that there will be not such a high correlation between mechanical ventilation and HIV. If there was a high correlation between them, then you would potentially accept that it would not be a difference. But here I'm pretty sure that it will be not significant. Okay, so this was, so here we start with 0 0.04. We do not know whether is it true or not. <laughs> and then we say, yes, the effect is an anti-inflammatory anti one. Did they prove that there was an anti-inflammatory one? And did they check during the trial that there was an anti-inflammatory effect? No. So the overall probability is much, much higher than 0 0.04. So while we say prob prob ah, no, it's negative. There we continue simply to use it. And again, if I, was, uh, if I have to, to say to the pharmaceutical industry, well, we should do the trial, I would say, don't do it. Everybody use it. So the only thing that can happen is that everybody will stop with combination therapy. Here also the conclusion, combination antibiotic therapy improves survival among critical with No, it's associated with, at least associated, but does not improve. That's a clear cut for me. Don't forget that we all have conflict of interest. And of course, it's not really with the intention, but still, it has an influence. And I would uh, say, certainly for the clinicians here in this room, um, to listen to William Osler, who already say that medicine is learned by the bedside and not in the classroom. But not your conceptions of diseases come from here, uh, words here in the lecture room, so don't listen to me or read from the book, see and then reason and compare and control, but see first. So if you see a trial that is not in line with what you see at the bedside, please ask you the question where the trial is. And don't, don't inverse the thing and saying, well, the trial is certainly that is high level science. I would do that. So I simply want to put a little bit uh, reflection into your heads and simply say that you still have to be, to look into the, detail to all these trials. Uh, I thank you. So I hope I was within my 30 minutes.